record this for those that couldn't join us today but wanted to. Um, I would ask everyone just to mute their mics for the most part. Use the chat function where you can for questions. Um, we'll unmute you if, you, if um, there's a question that we want to throw to you. Um, otherwise, it just helps us to keep a little more organized. Uh, I'd like to welcome New Market Aurora MP Tony Van Bynen today and thank him for his time this morning. And just before we get started, I don't know if everyone knows about a little art installation that got um, released this weekend that was unveiled. Let me see if I can just share a little something. Um, so Tony Van Bynen was uh, honored this weekend by a public art installation that was unveiled and pays tribute for his 18 years on council and 12 as our mayor. Um, known as the community living room, I went and saw it, sat down on it, pretty comfy for a stone couch. Um, at, known as the community living room, it's to recognize Tony's belief that the downtown is the living room of the community and where he held regular drop-in sessions, mayor in the square, making himself accessible to the community, just like he's doing today. So I have a couple of pictures from it for those of you that haven't gotten down to Riverwalk Commons to see it yet. Um, this was the day it was unveiled, Tony and his lovely wife, Roxanne. A little, another view of the whole installation. And uh, this is my favorite part, Tony's cap and the two cell phones <laughs> that he always carried. These ones are old school. I think they're Blackberries, aren't they? Aren't they, Tony? I mean, I love my yeah, Blackberries. They, they, were, they, are, they were Blackberries, that's right. That's right. Yeah, they had the, to pry my Blackberry out of my fingers. <laughs> well, the the other interesting thing is, is I actually had to give up the hat because they needed the hat to shape the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the bronzing. And there's still some fibers of the hat still in the, in the, in the bronze uh, piece there. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and then the book of puns, because you're never without a, a, a <laughs> pun. I was going to say a groaner, but that's not really nice. <laughs> well, and, and you know, uh, having had a look at the budget, is the one thing that uh, Roxanne uh, mentioned to me. With this all being stone, it's going to be so hard to find the quarters between the cushions so we can balance the budget this year, you know? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's That's true. Be... I think you better be looking for loonies or maybe some lost bills this year. Yeah, exactly. Um, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that and, and congrat congratulations, Tony. That's, that's Thank awesome you. and well-deserved. Thank you. Well, prior to that, of course, um, I was a banker for 30 years in uh, the town councilor. Uh, and so I made a commitment to my wife to write a book about retirement. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that was only on the condition that it only had three chapters. <laughs> that was one of You're the things so that well I had to agree retirement. to. That only lasted like hmm, a couple of months, did it not, before you? <laughs> yeah, no, it did. Yeah. That bounced yeah. a new one. Um, so I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that. Um, obviously, why have we gathered today? On Wednesday, we heard the speech from the throne. And we'd like to understand, you know, the critical elements of that speech and what the direction uh, means to our community and certainly to our businesses. So I would just like to turn it over now to uh, MP Van Bynen to kind of take us through his thoughts. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, I, I continue to appreciate the good work that the Chamber of Commerce has been doing for, um, uh, that the Chamber, Chamber of Commerce has been doing, um, you know, right from the very beginning on this situation. There's been, there's been uh, huge support from the Chamber in terms of uh, helping uh, the members find their way through some of the programs. Many of these programs have been extended. Um, as, as you know, though, this still uh, appears as a bill before the government. Uh, it's Bill uh, C-2, uh, and, uh, and it contains the conditions. And uh, we anticipate that we're, we're likely going to uh, have the vote before the end of this current week. Uh, and we're, we're feeling confident that there will be sufficient support to see it through. But basically, uh, without getting into too much detail and getting into too much um, of, uh, of some of the, uh, the, the, the key messages that we've been provided, um, there are four main parts to uh, the throne speech. Uh, and, uh, and the first, first and foremost is fighting the pandemic and saving lives. Unless we get on top of uh, this pandemic, uh, there will be no economic recovery. Uh, and, and I think that many of you may have seen uh, Christian Freeland in her interview. 
Uh, and uh, and it's, it's great to see that the government's confidence is that we will be on top of this. We are investing in, in uh, research. We are investing in, uh, in vaccinations. Uh, and, uh, and we're confident that we will be turning the corner. Um, the second part of this is that we're, we're working on supporting individuals and businesses through the crisis. This is, this is un, I don't know how many times I've used it, but it is unprecedented. Uh, and uh, we've never seen anything of this scope and scale uh, in the past. And so the measures that we've taken, first and foremost, were, had to be swift, um, where they were necessarily imprecise. Um, and we've been fine tuning these as, as, uh, as we were implementing the programs. And much of that was based on the feedback that we were getting from uh, ch uh, Chambers of Commerce, some of our discussions with uh, residents and businesses as we went forward. The third uh, is that we're going to build back better. And, uh, and I've committed to use the phrase a green recovery and a new green deal, which is what I believe has to happen. Um, we need to start thinking about building an economy that's focused on the future. Um, there, there are many uh, books uh, and there's, there's tons of literature that talks about how we need to get away from fossil fuels. Now that would have a very dramatic impact on a significant portion of our economy. And so what we need to do is to make sure that we're focused that as we implement the, uh, the new economy and the green economy, that we see that there's, there's benefits that go all the way across Canada. Uh, and, and hydrogen is one of those opportunities. Uh, both Quebec and Alberta have the highest uh, uh, potential to be engaged in the in manufacture of uh, hydrogen. So, so um, it has to be uh, all encompassing and it has to be inclusive. Uh, and uh, third, and, or the, the final uh, platform is standing up for who we are as Canadians and making sure that we deal with the issue of systemic racism, that we uh, reconcile uh, the, with the Indigenous peoples and the, the commitment of um, implementing the uh, United Nations Declaration for Indigenous People by the end of the year is a very significant step forward in my mind. Um, what we've done in the past over the last six months, um, we've, uh, we know that there was a struggle and, and, uh, and I think all of us uh, have felt that it was very much like the wild, wild west when it uh, came to uh, finding PPEs. A lot, everybody was manufacturing PPEs, not all of them met the standards. So I think we've turned the corner in, in terms of uh, supplying the, the, the PPEs and we've shipped them across Canada. Um, we've, we've had to uh, go forward and, and put Canadian Armed Forces people into long-term care facilities to make sure that we were protecting the elderly. Uh, and uh, close to 9 million people were helped with the emergency response benefit with 3.5 million jobs that were supported by the wage subsidy. Um, and also, uh, uh, I don't want to minimize the fact that the government has invested over $19 billion for a state for a, a safe restart agreement with an additional $2 billion for a safe return to class fund, along with funding of uh, First Nations communities. Uh, so what, what will we do next? The federal government will continue uh, to be there to help the provinces increase their testing capacity, uh, consistent with the first uh, platform that we have. And as soon as tests are approved, and I know there's a considerable amount of controversy about uh, uh, why aren't we doing any, why aren't we doing any of these fast tracking? But the reality is, is that, that uh, um, a test that has not proven to be efficient or effective um, is can do more damage by uh, giving people the impression that they're not infected. Uh, and uh, so we're being very careful in terms of, uh, of uh, going forward and approving the different tests. But we're, we're putting a considerable amount of uh, energy in that. And we will be establishing a, a testing assistance response team to make sure that we implement those uh, things as quickly as possible. Um, the government uh, will work to target some additional financial supports directly to businesses which have uh, temporarily uh, had to shut down uh, as a result of the, the pandemic. I'm, I'm going to refer to this as restart money and what does that look like and what's the criteria that yet needs to be determined. Um, but Bill C2 will be going forward for discussion and debate. Um, it involves uh, the Canada Recovery Benefit, which will support workers who are self-employed and not eligible for EI, 
It will involve the Canada Recovery Sickness Benefit for workers who uh, must self-isolate for the COVID-19 and the Canada Recovery Care Giving Benefit also for people who uh, find themselves having to stay home because their children uh, are unable to, uh, uh, to, find, to go to school or to find the appropriate daycare. Um, the uh, Canada's vaccine strategy is all about ensuring that Canadians uh, will be able to get a vaccine once it is ready. The government has already secured access to a number of vaccine candidates uh, and, it's all, and it's already announced some investments with the manufacturing here at home. Uh, as well, we've made some uh, further uh, investments to improve our capacity for the vaccine distribution. We've established a vaccine task force and we've also established an immunity task force, uh, which involves Canada's top scientists and minds going forward. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure uh, uh, the primary concern for the chamber members is, uh, the, you know, where, where are we going as we go forward with the jobs? Uh, people have been losing their jobs and that's probably, not probably, is the clearest consequence of the, uh, the global economic shock that Canadians and other countries are experiencing now. And at the start of the pandemic, I have to say that we were very quick to act with the CERB and the CWES. And acknowledging that it was imprecise, we were able to modify and adjust uh, the programs as we went forward. And that I think will be done as well as we launch these additional programs as we go forward. But first and foremost, uh, uh, our priority, once we get ourselves on top of this pandemic, is to uh, get Canadians back to work. We intend to launch a campaign to create more than a million jobs to uh, restore employment to its previous levels. We intend to make some direct investments in the social sector and the infrastructure, uh, uh, including immediate training to uh, quickly skill up workers and to provide incentives for employers to hire and to retain workers. Uh, those, and the thing with the, with the throne speech is that it will be outlining our general direction. The details will need to be ironed out as we go forward. But uh, I'm hoping that this discussion will help talk about what is it, what is it that we need and what is it that the government is doing to go forward and to establish a general direction on the create. We're extending the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy to uh, the summer of 2021. And we intend to uh, create jobs for young Canadians through the uh, youth employment strategy. And we will be accelerating the uh, women entre entrepreneurship strategy. And uh, we will continue to fight for free trade with our international partners. Um, I think it's, it's important for us to have a conversation about women in the economy and, and uh, this pandemic uh, and the, the, the impact that that's had on women and particularly low income women uh, uh, there's been a very substantial impact uh, in, in the, uh, and I've seen that in New Market as well as, uh, as what we're seeing nationally. Uh, so we will be creating an action plan for women in the economy. And I think one of the significant platforms in that is access to reliable, um, affordable and accessible uh, childcare. And that's part of the platform as we're going forward as well. I've talked about extending the wage subsidy and the, Canada Emergency uh, Business Account um, will, will be extended uh, and uh, the, uh, the interest-free loans, there'll be uh, consideration for further extension to that. I think the, uh, the challenge will be is when are we going to see ourselves, when are we going to see ourselves turn the corner in terms of getting on top of the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, we'd be providing $500 a week for up to 26 weeks for the, the transitional uh, Canada recovery benefit for people who wouldn't traditionally qualify for EI. I've seen some early discussions on, on what the revised criteria uh, will be. Um, the, uh, to, to be eligible for that benefit, uh, you need to be not eligible for EI. You need to, provide, to uh, reside in Canada. Uh, and be at least uh, 15 years old with a valid social insurance number. I think we can get uh, a lot of that information uh, from, the, uh, from the website. And what I'll do then is um, the, um, the economic response plan website will be updated on a very consistent basis uh, and frequently. 
Um, so I think that's uh, uh, that in addition to the Canada.ca website. Um, also, um, there's a great partnership between, uh, between the Canadian Chamber of Commerce and the Government of Canada uh, to create the Canadian Business Resilience Network. And I think that uh, there's a lot of good resources that are available there. Um, there are other um, websites that are linked through the Canadian Business uh, Resilience, Canadian Business Resilience Network .ca, uh, and you could uh, you'll find information on the PPE Supply Hub, on uh, the post promise to uh, where employees uh, would be able to look at the how to prevent uh, serious uh, risk in the workplace as far as uh, as far as COVID goes. And uh, there's also the opportunity there, we're recommending that you consult with the Canadian Centre for Occupational Health and Safety as we go forward. So there's free online services that are available there. Um, and what I'd like to do now is to just turn it over to any questions that you might have uh, and get the benefit of your perspectives, as I know that this is going to be, you know, the topic for, this, for discovery or for discussion ongoing as we go forward. So um, is, is there anything there that anyone else would like to have some additional information? On? Thank you, Tony. I, um, I know that, as you said, it's not really about the detail at this point, but I know the Canadian Chamber has highlighted the need for even a, a mini budget by the end of October. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Determine these things. I am going to turn it over to Abdus Samad, our Director of Government Relations and Policy, to kind of work through um mm -hmm. anybody's questions and i know he may have a few for us as well uh, so abdis if i can turn it over to you on this monday morning sure uh good morning uh everyone and good morning and even good to see you again um uh so if anybody does have a question uh please um submit it in the chat box and i will call, I'll call you out um in the meantime, I, I have a question. So, uh, Yvonne Biden, one of the one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, points made in the throne speech called for the breakdown of interprovincial uh, trade barriers, uh, which is something the Canadian Chamber, uh, as you may know, has been uh, advocating for for uh, almost a decade. Uh, so, we are really happy to hear that. Is there any details you can provide? I know the throne speech is, is just a general framework. Uh, the details have to be ironed out, but uh, any um, that would be great. Well, first, first of all, um, it's it's good to see that uh, we're providing for that discussion. The details of the discussion, um, I, I I don't have any uh, direct, but I do know that a it's a priority, and as we all know, we need to be able to get consensus amongst all the provinces and territories. Um, it's a discussion that's been going on for a long period of time. Um, one of the things that um, um, that this pandemic highlights. Uh, is that it's exposed things that we've we've said we should get to, but have never found a sense of urgency to deal with that. Um, so uh, this interprovincial trade barriers is is a is a classic example of something that's becoming a priority as a result of the the the, the economic circumstances we're facing here. Another uh, example is the way that we've uh, advanced uh, technology. Um, if had it not been for the pandemic, I doubt very much that we'd be sitting down having Zoom meetings and virtual meetings and virtual parliaments uh, that uh, that we're able to do now. So, so what this has done is created a sense of urgency, uh, and I do know that it's a top priority. And we need to uh, we need to be able to to expedite trading uh, amongst ourselves, and, and we want to start creating, I think, some some independent supply chains, particularly for for some of the uh, PPEs that uh, we're looking at and for some of the vaccines. The, the one challenge that uh, uh, we're seeing as a result of this as well is it's starting to polarize, it's starting to break down the, uh, the, the global supply chains uh, because of the risks now in uh, some of these urgent, uh, urgent situations. So yes, it's important. Do I have details? No. How's that for a summary? It's a good summary. Still, I, I got more details out of that than, uh, uh, than I had uh part of the discussion. Um, Naki, you had a question. I can just mute you. Go right ahead. N Naki. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought uh, <laughs> I put it on the chat. 
<laughs> Hello, how are you? And again, congratulations on that amazing living room. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to know if the application process for the CRBs is established yet, or uh, when do you anticipate uh, that might be coming out? Um, that's, that's something I am not up to date on, but if you do connect with our office, they'd be able to, to, uh, to give you that, uh, the, the, impl the implementation schedule on that. The, the, are you, uh, which, what program are you looking at? Nike? It's the, uh, the Canadian, um, uh, recovery benefit, uh, okay. the one that's replacing uh, CERB. Ah, yes. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't have the details on that, but, uh, we might be able to give you that uh, uh, and we'll have someone in our office uh, chase it down if you, if you want to zip a note over to the office, okay? Sure, yep. thank you. Okay. Merrick, did you want to go, did you want to ask your question? Well, I just, uh, I posted it on the chat, but I would like to personally thank Tony for his involvement in the, uh, in, in, in voicing our our hospitality industry's uh, concerns uh, uh, to the federal government and uh, it looks like it worked Tony I really appreciate it because our industry which was one of the hardest hit by COVID uh, in Canadian economy was actually specifically mentioned in, in, in the speech so thank you very much I really appreciate it on behalf of, of, of all hotels oh, I really appreciate it and and I would like to say that we are looking for obviously as everybody for for details uh, of these programs, uh, because this is where the most important issues will come out. So thank you very much. And, uh, and I hope this pandemic ends soon, very soon, let's put it this way. Thank I'll you. second that, uh, but, but Merrick, I do want to say the information that you were able to provide us has been very helpful. Uh, and, and, and it's not until we start uh, providing the grassroots information on how this is affecting our residents and, and affecting our businesses uh, that we uh, that we can, you know, put forward a compelling argument in terms of things that need to be considered. So uh, it's it's a two way street. It's uh, it's very helpful for us to hear what the situation is, uh, because until we know what the issue is, it's it's hard to develop solutions. So so I appreciate you uh, bringing those concerns forward as well. Excellent. Any any other. I'll just hop in for a second. Um, I think that listening to the businesses, Tony, and, and conversations like this are really helpful because I know that more than a million Canadians lost their jobs through this and, and certainly Canadian businesses are the ones that can create those jobs and, and bring people back. So the economic policies and taxes, reskilling, upskilling, all of those pieces right now that our businesses have a lot of um, comments on. And, and I think there's been some roundtables that have been really helpful um, in terms of them outlining, um, you know, ideas that, that can really help them. And I, there's been some surprises for me along the way as well. So um, I think these conversations certainly help, but, you know, um, the businesses really are those job creators. You know, one of the one of the challenges I think for the government, for any government, is the fact that uh, it's the scope and the scale of the issues that they're dealing with, um, and and somehow we have to be able to translate that to what's happening at the grassroots level, what's happening on the ground at the implementation uh, uh, level. So so that's critically important, and that's why the dialogue that that we have now, or or any of the other discussions. Have, I've always, I've always, always valued a, a dialogue with businesses and with individuals, um, because anybody who thinks they have all the answers, are, they're only fooling one person, and that's themselves. So the, what we do affects so many people in so many different ways, and when you stay at that level, you need to be able to, to, uh, to uh, distill that down to what does this look like for a person who's getting up in the morning and creating jobs. I don't envy you. I could barely do my own budget this year, like <laughs> guessing. So, I mean, I can't even imagine. Um, well, Neil Moore had a question. Uh, can you tell us more about federal plans for a more robust green economy? Neil, I don't know if you want to add to that, but that was the question. Yeah, I guess. Uh, good morning, Tony. Good morning, Neil. <laughs> Yeah, I've been uh, doing a little bit of reading, and uh, Tony, you've probably done some of the same reading, that there's a real opportunity in the oil patch in terms of um, 
uh, dormant oil wells and just the current uh, oil sands up in, uh, you know, up in the north. And uh, there are ways of extracting hydrogen that are both uh, environmentally friendly and probably, from what I've read, a lot less expensive than actually getting oil out of the oil sands. So I see there's a huge opportunity to become a world leader in hydrogen and uh, just wondered about your thoughts on that as well. Well, um, I've, uh, I've gone through a lot of reading. A couple of the, the, the third industrial Re revolution um, was uh, one that was uh, very clarifying for me. Um, and that is the, the need for us to get off of fossil fuels and, uh, and hydrogen is one of those solutions as well, as well as hydroelectric power. Uh, the, as you'd raised uh, earlier there, Neil, is that hydrogen is an opportunity to create green jobs in the areas or the provinces that may, uh, that have been very dependent on the, the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and so this is one of the ways in terms of how we focus and implement uh, the plans going forward that we can include people that, uh, that will be disenfranchised, right? Uh, in part by the pandemic uh, and in a shift in the economy uh, to go towards different industries. So it's one way to include a much broader, uh, a much broader part of the uh, the economy, uh, because of the resources that they have. So, so when we say we're going to a green economy, it doesn't mean that we're going to disenfranchise uh, any one particular group of provinces. It means we have to find ways to transition them into what's important. So, frankly, after we get after we deal with this pandemic, if we don't deal with the climate. Um, uh, we're we're going to have some very serious repercussions. I mean, you've seen how much of how much has disappeared in Greenland as far as the ice fields go. We've seen how much uh, the water levels have increased and create problems in the Great Lakes. So um, you know these are two things that we really need to be able to get on top of, and we need to seriously commit to. The Earth will survive. Will mankind? Is the question. Thanks, Tony. So I have uh, uh, another question that came in. Um, are there any details you can provide on the revamped uh, uh, wage subsidy? Uh, I know that uh, I know the program is being restructured. Uh, are there any details that you could provide? The the one thing that I do know is the uh, I think there, it was initially at. Uh, $400 the transition and the and as a result of some of the feedback that went to $500 you're you're thinking about the Canada recovery benefit right so the transition to that is what will happen is the unemployment insurance or the employment insurance infrastructure will be the mechanism that's going to deliver those benefits uh, so that it'll require some revamping on those uh, and it'll require uh, some some changes to the criteria for eligibility to, uh, to uh, support the people that would not have normally qualified. And in part of that, I think, is providing a base number of hours so that people would qualify uh, in, in the high unemployment areas. Uh, the mechanism itself, I'm not familiar with the details, but uh, as it comes out, maybe we could have our office uh, forward that on to you. Although I'd be surprised that you weren't onto it before we were, the way that you're following up on these things. So, so uh, that's... It's something that once the information is available, well, let's let's make every effort to to get it to your members. And as I've said earlier, you've done a great job doing that. And often you've beaten us to the to the, uh, the release. Um, one final question on my end, and then Tracy, I'll turn it back over to you. So, as a we are we are a business organization, and we do look at fiscal restraint um, now recognizing the uniqueness of, uh, of the pandemic and, the, and the, how the landscape has been significantly altered, uh, we, we understand why um, you know, fun, uh, so much um, investments were poured into supporting the economy, to keeping it afloat. Um, but in the throne speech, uh, there's a lot of spending uh, that, that is happening. Is there a plan or some kind of um, five, 10 year framework to bring us back to uh, a point where we're not dealing with a trillion dollar debt, essentially? Yeah. Well, uh, first, first and foremost, you know, as 30 years as a banker, I've, uh, I've looked at a lot of balance sheets um, and, uh, 
and, I, and I've learned that there, there are two purposes for credit. Uh, number one is uh, the, 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 the liquidity, uh, and the other one is, is uh, for uh, find, uh, funding assets. Uh, and, and, and I think what we need to be is very careful as, as to think of assets as solely hard uh, material things like machinery and equipment. I think one of the assets that we need to think about now that we need to build is changing the, the, the nature and the education of, uh, of uh, our students, of improving our research and technology and improving uh, science. Um, and, and at this point in time, I think we need to think about getting through the pandemic as a one-time event. Uh, and again, going back to my banking career, if, if what we were doing was financing ongoing operating losses, that's not a happy story in the long run, right? Uh, but, but there are times when you need to create some liquidity. There are times where you need to finance things that are urgent to the survival of the business. And the business in the case of the government of Canada is the survival of the economy. Uh, so if we look at this as a one-time investment to get us through uh, the, the, the pandemic crisis, then we will then we have to start focusing on on reducing that in the longer term. Uh, can I can I put some uh, time frames on that? Uh, the the uh, parliamentary budget officer has indicated that these expenditures are not sustainable beyond one or two years. I'm confident that we'll be on top of the pandemic during that time, and the recovery time, whatever it is, uh, is 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 going to be probably an extended period of time. It's a lot like buying a house. You'll never buy a house if you're going to save cash for that. So you need to have some what I what I refer to as constructive debt uh, to help you acquire and to 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 get through what your needs are currently. But in the longer term, you're absolutely right, and and I've. In my own mind, I'd speculate that it might take us five or 10 years to get, to get back to uh, where we were. Scope and the scale of this pandemic is just astronomical. That's, that's fair. That's fair. Um, Tracy, back to you. Great. So I'm not seeing a lot of questions come up, which really surprises me with this group that is here because I, I know you're all usually vocal, but uh, I will... Uh, I'll just uh, either chalk it up to Monday morning or we're all still on the early stages of, of this um, particular um, speech and the fact that, that we still, um, it's just actually at this point out there and, and not approved. So mm -hmm. um, I do think that there's a, a, oh, now they're starting. Okay, good. Um, David Hanna has a question. David, do you want to ask it yourself? Yes, good morning. Uh, good to see you, Tony. Good to see uh, the town recognizing all of your prior achievements. Um, it was also good to see you chosen to be one of the eight MPs to visit the Senate for the throne speech. I've got one other question, but that's just a sidelight there. How was that? that how did that happen? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what the criteria was. <laughs> uh, Dave, the the, I, I got a call in the morning saying, um, you know, we're, we're permitted to have, I think, eight or nine people to, to go over the throne speech. Uh, and, uh, and this being the second throne speech, it was, uh, it was uh, especially more uh, rewarding because I knew what to anticipate at this time. Um, it, was, it, uh, it, it, was, I, it was a great honor. I felt really good to be engaged in that. It, uh, it, was, it felt good. And, uh, and being part of the tradition, I think, is great, but also we... What I'm looking forward to is being part of the change and the evolution of the new economy and building a better country. Uh, that's that's where, where I want to spend more time doing. Well, Tony, my spec second question in relation to the country, and this is obviously an in your opinion uh, question, how do you see the relationship with the United States evolving in, in the next near future? That's something I wouldn't want to speculate on, uh, David. I know that there's a, a lot of conversations going on by brighter minds than mine, uh, and I think that there's, there's a lot of dialogue. I think the outcome of the election will, uh, will set the tone uh, for the next four years uh, quite significantly. Um, but uh, uh, I'm glad that we have uh, the, the likes of our uh, global affairs people 
uh, who are, are intimately involved in ongoing conversations and working for the best interests of our country. So I don't think that I I, there would be any benefit in me speculating on which way that would go, uh, because I have to openly admit that, I, that I'm, I'm not familiar enough with the details. I think Christia Freeland is showing us that uh, she's world-class at that level. I, now that's something I will readily agree with. Uh, I'm quite impressed with Christia. She's, She's a very bright mind and, uh, and she certainly is focused on what's right for Canada. Uh, and she has very well shown her ability to stand up for Canada in, in many negotiations. So, so the, the good news is, is we've got great people in charge of that role. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Kelsey has asked a question about childcare. Obviously that was featured um, as part of the uh, throne speech. Just wondering if you have any other thoughts or can expand on that. Yeah, without getting, uh, no, I'm very, I'm very reluctant to, to uh, provide numbers unless I have them right in front of me, but I thought uh, there was a recent announcement with, for a very significant number of child, affordable child care spaces that were going to be made available. I think Minister Hussein made an announcement last week. Um, we can, we can send that over to you. Um, but first and foremost, I think childcare has to be a priority for many reasons, right? You have to have a safe, affordable place that, uh, that, uh, that you can have your children because uh, the, the, uh, the recession has often been referred to as the she session because uh, there's a very significant amount of women who have chosen to stay home uh, uh, to look after their children. So, so we need to get women back into the workforce uh, and, uh, uh, and I think child care is an important part going forward with that. Agreed. Um, I know that uh, Naki has put up a question about any sector specific help plan for the travel industry. And I do believe that was highlighted tra hospitality and travel. Um, certainly aerospace, we've heard that that's one that's been hard hit as well. Um, any further details or thoughts on those particular well, sectors? Apart from the fact that uh, we're acutely aware that these are industries that are going to take longer than the normal uh, recovery cycle, uh, and uh, and their business cycle is much longer and, and harder. Travel industry, uh, particularly, it's, you know, they don't actually get their net revenue until after the trip has been taken, right? Uh, and so uh, that that's stretched the business cycle out, and that's uh, created a real problem as far as the liquidity. Uh, but also uh, a big part of that is is getting the population comfortable with embracing the level of risk that there will be in travel, right? Uh, and it all comes back to how soon can we get this vaccine so that people are getting the comfort level that, that they'll go out and buy things or that they will travel and then that, that they'll take vacations. So uh, in terms of specific programs, uh, I'm not aware of any as yet, but I'm sure that the details will roll out shortly after Bill C-2 is, uh, is adopted. Yeah, it is hard when we're in the early phases of that. Uh, I, uh, Jennifer McLaughlin, speaking of uh, women entrepreneurs, you had a question about that. Sorry, my unmute. Uh, I do, thank you. And Tony, thank you for bringing everything forward like everybody's mentioned and, uh, and Tracy, you as well in the chamber. Is there a, a general sense into the investment into women entrepreneurs that was, uh, that was touched on? I know you, you mentioned childcare and I do think that's very important for most women entrepreneurs, but is there digital or is, and what does that investment on the surface look like? Well, um, the, the one thing I do know is that they'll be accelerating the women entrepreneurship strategy. Uh, what does that look like when, uh, when we get to the delivery point? Um, it's uh, something that uh, we need to get some more details on. But what's, what's important about this is, A, the understanding of how important it is to get women back uh, into, the, into the workforce uh, and recognizing and acknowledging that we need to, we need to spend some time and energy and resources to accelerate uh, the program. So um, it's, it's in the plan. Uh, what does it look like when it, uh, when it uh, 
when it comes to the implementation stages needs to be determined as yet. So we are, we, we keep coming back to being a little early in, in terms of, of what does it look like. And, and hopefully maybe we can get back together in a month or so uh, and, uh, and we'll, we'll have more details. That's fair. And I think in the meantime, uh, we're doing provincial submissions as well. I think something's going on with my mic here. Um, the other thing that, that came to mind is I know that in terms of COVID and, and the vaccine and talking about childcare, I, I mean, and all of these getting back to work pieces means more interaction uh, between individuals, which is during the pandemic, certainly a, a concern. So I, I know that concentration um, on the vaccine is very important. I think the other thing that occurs to me as we're talking is so many of the themes we're talking about are interwoven between provincial and federal um, levels of government. So I wonder if I could just ask in terms of collaboration now more than ever, how, how is our federal government looking at that? Uh, the, um, the, the sense of urgency that the pandemic has brought forward has every, everybody has set aside their political stripes and focused on the shared constituent. And that was really, really reassuring. And that continues to a, a large degree. I think that as we go forward and, and as we start looking at long-term plans, we'll, we'll probably be uh, looking at um, some differences on what might, what might be the best uh, implementation program. I think probably a classic example of that is the, uh, the rent subsidy program. It's, uh, it's one program, and I always keep referring back to it, that's the toughest nut to crack. And, and, and frankly, it's one of the most important things that entrepreneurs and business people are facing and struggling with. Uh, because you can't borrow your way out of that. If you don't have the revenues uh, and you still have the expenses, that goes right to the bottom line as a dead loss. Uh, and, and so that's something that, uh, that I find very frustrating that we haven't been able to make any further progress. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I'm not dodging the issue, but, but landlord-tenant relationships are, are uh, within the provincial domain. Uh, there is there has been negotiations on where the federal government has agreed to fund a portion of that, but the implementation part is is uh, for me uh, not as good as it could or should be. So that's uh, but uh, I, I see that we're you know formative feedback is great. I think formative feedback and improving programs and, and offering solutions um, uh, that's that's something that is more productive than just direct criticism. Uh, and uh, and uh, in, in my mind, there is no room for partisanship at this point in time. I think we need to get ourselves through the pressing issue. Uh, so, so I think the pandemic has done a lot for us to realize the urgency of the situation and how we must work together. Uh, and, and I'm optimistic, frankly, that, uh, that we can continue to do that and find solutions. Will there be bumps in the road? Of course there will be, but uh, how well we respond to those, I think. Yeah, and I think the rent program is a very good one to bring up because that was going to be one of my next questions around that and, and how can the federal government help? I mean, it's one of the areas that we just have not figured out and it's the one that was the loudest cry continually. Um, and maybe the one that impacts us most from an economic standpoint as far as businesses are concerned. And, and yes, the relationship between, um, you know, landlords and tenants is important, but many of those didn't have pre-established relationships or, or maybe they didn't even really have interaction with their landlords. So um, this is one that provincially, federally, we just, we haven't been able to come to terms with and it, it's, it's only going to get worse. <laughs> I, I agree. And from, from the entrepreneur's point of view, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's critical. Um, and, uh, you know, in some of the conversations that I've had, we also, need to, we also need to bear in mind that perhaps the landlord has some obligations as well. Uh, and that they, they, have, they have mortgage payments to meet, et cetera. Uh, and so um, any one solution, I, I think, will not be absolute. And it will and it'll very much depend on the individual circumstances. As you say, the relationship between the landlord and the tenant uh, and uh, uh, trying to resolve what the individual needs are. 
and I'm optimistic, sometimes, most of the times, there's a solution that, that works well for everybody. Uh, but, it, but it involves compromise on, on, the, on the part of all parties. I think you know, covering 50% of, the, of the, uh, the, the rent itself, providing the funding for that, uh, I think is a significant step. Now we just need to make sure, how do we, how do we make this work? Because it isn't happening. And I'm as disappointed as you are, Tracy. Yeah. <laughs> And I think making it happen as quickly as possible now, I mean, we're coming into the, the colder season, things like restaurants, that gyms, all these people who can't bring in more, like they can't ever get back right now to their regular levels of, of business, which is what their, their business ROI was built on. Yeah, the, and I think the most unsettling thing is, is in, in this new environment, un, until we get on top of the, the, uh, the pandemic, um, will the business models work? For example, with the reduced volumes or, or the, you know, the, the greater space, um, I, I can't imagine that there's enough margin in, in the pricing of a restaurant meal that would permit you to reduce your, the population inside the building uh, and still make it viable in the long run. So, so uh, first and foremost, let's get ourselves past, let's get ourselves around the corner here uh, and make sure that we do everything that needs to be done to, to get us past the vaccination stage and then, and then start working on the recovery. And, and even on the front end of it, I mean, trying to keep those numbers down, obviously, because the last thing we wanna see are some of those businesses closing again. Um, I like that provincially we've been, and re, we've been looking at it regionally and provincially based on, um, you know, trying to keep the social interactions down in order to keep the numbers down versus looking at the businesses uh, and i think anything we can do to help businesses easily adjust to this as much as possible to that they are doing safe practices um, and showing that those numbers aren't coming from the businesses as much as possible i think that's that's going to be key as well from our perspective um, you know getting, getting to the science and defining where the risk areas are and then focusing on those risk areas um, I'm, I was on the, uh, the HESA, which is the health committee, uh, and we, uh, we, uh, we heard from a lot of different witnesses. And one that uh, most impressed me was looking at the socioeconomic impact of, uh, of uh, the pandemic. And the, the point that he made, which was really resonated with me, is if we had focused what was in the curve if we focused on what was in the curve as opposed to managing the curve, uh, we would have we would have uh, had a far more effective response. In other words, um, when you're looking at people who uh, who are in very close quarters, right? Uh, people who are in and in, in, in people uh, the socioeconomic uh, circumstances drives them to be closer. Drives, uh, uh, and, and that's where there's a really high level of in, of infection. And so if we'd been able to drill down to that a little more quickly, then maybe the results might have been a lot sooner. And it goes back to what you're saying is, let's focus on the regional and, and, uh, and the specific uh, things so that we can be more effective in dealing with it from a, from a scientific point of view or, or from a preventive point of view. So, what, I'm hoping what, federally uh, we'll avoid those emergency measures too that impact businesses. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm glad. I mean, we've learned a lot through the pandemic. I mean, it has been seven months and it's just, you know, it's timing. I, mm -hmm. Even businesses who prepared with, you know, the savings and, and the correct amount of reserves uh, at this point, some of those have, uh, have long gone away and that's yeah. for those that did prepare yeah. with reserves. So, mm -hmm. um, Jennifer McLaughlin has just added a point into the, into the chat again about, um, you know the challenge coming with with the amounts of those leases and rents and so it's it's definitely on weighing on the minds of our our entrepreneurs and our business owners yeah. Yeah. um so i don't know if anyone else has any questions or if you have any closing remarks that you wanted to leave us with well um i hadn't prepared any closing remarks and and uh, and, and frankly <laughs> i i enjoy I enjoy having this on a conversational basis. I, I think that uh, that's more effective for me and, and, and it's worked well. But um, let me just say for sure 
I, I am convinced that the government's intent is to make sure that we take the steps we need to get past this, this, uh, this crisis. I'm, uh, I'm concerned about the numbers that I'm seeing uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I continue to be an optimist in terms of the way that we're going to be able to respond to it more effectively. Uh, it's certainly, it's something that we hope we never have to be an expert at, uh, but it's something that we're going to have to get better at. Uh, and, and frankly, I am so impressed with Patty Haizu and Dr. Tam and their level of commitment. To, uh, these, these people and their senior teams are uh, running into uh, the kinds of hours that many of the entrepreneurs are uh, uh, having to commit to their business when they're, when they're in a, a crisis. So 18 hour days almost seems to be the, or, the norm for many of those. So, so my heart goes out to them for the effort and the energy that they're, that they're putting into it. Uh, and, uh, and, and I want that to be a priority because that's the only way we're gonna make this work. Uh, and I understand as a, as a 30 year banker, uh, the way that, that entrepreneurs put their heart and their life and a lot of their resources into this. And, and so it's, uh, it's critical, it's important. I think the government understands that. They hear it often enough uh, within the government themselves. And, uh, um, and, and I think there's that commitment to go forward. So it's, uh, it's a challenge, but I think we will overcome that challenge. It's the journey along the way that's going to, that's going to I hope, strengthen us in our resolve. Yes. There's peaks and valleys for sure. Um, Jennifer Walker did mention the testing and results window um, has to improve and it's, it's a good point. I know it's provincially in, in many cases, but federally there's, there's impact on that as well. Um, you know, the sooner people can get those, I, I, I can't tell you how many people I'm hearing lately that are at home while they await their results, <laughs> which um, has slowed down certainly as more people are accessing those, but uh, it, it is impacting businesses as well, not having their staffing yeah. available. And <laughs> yeah, no, I, and you, unless you're absolutely sure, you don't want to expose your customers to that. Uh, but uh, you know, it, uh, the, the 18 billion we put into that into that should be producing some results in terms of availability. I think uh, the the technology uh, and the quick turnaround time, like uh, you know, there there's a lot of uh, quick tests that are being tested. But what's really critically important is that we have to be able to rely on the accuracy of those tests, or we will create a bigger problem because it gives a false sense of security going forward. So so. Uh, uh, Research and, and, and science is going to have to get us there very quickly. And yeah, and I'm thankful. Yeah. <laughs> hmm? I'm thankful for the investment that your government is putting into it. And, and uh, I know Minister Elliott spoke on a call last week with us about a saliva test that has some great promise to it and could be made available even to employers for their employees, which would be great if we get to that point, certainly. Yeah. Um, Maybe the new normal as we go forward. Um, but again, needs to be accurate and reliable. Agreed. And I'm not seeing any further questions. If you wanna put your hand up or ask a question, otherwise I think we will wrap just a couple of minutes ahead of schedule and give you back your Mondays. Well, thank, thank you, Tracy. Thank let's you. Some, uh, let's set some time aside when we have some more details. I'd be happy to have that conversation there, okay? Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Tony. Take care. Thanks, everyone.